<laughs> so now we're gonna have a amazing lunchtime keynote situation. Um, I really like this next person. They're a, a great moderator, a great person. They're just absolutely amazing at everything that they do. Um, hopefully she'll buy me dinner after this. Um, Every day, uh, <laughs> but uh, in all honesty, I think this will be a great discussion uh, with uh, Marissa Barrett, uh, um and Shari Robinson, who will be our moderator for this discussion. Um, so just without further ado, I'll invite Dr. Shari Robinson uh, from UNH to come up here and moderate or introduce our keynote. Who is that handsome, articulate young man? See, I made myself nervous. Good afternoon. Okay, okay. so that's why it's falling. So let's do that. It's a new time. Okay. Oh, I don't know about you all, but so I'm gonna. People that know me know I try to keep it real, um, but I'm gonna be on my good behavior because I want them to invite me back. And, and all so no, honestly, for real, for real. Um, the last, this morning, I, Shelly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna borrow, wherever Shelly is, I'm gonna borrow her, her phrase. It has been um, invigorating and infuriating. Um, a woman, a seasoned woman, like a beautiful seasoned woman like myself. Um, thank you, I appreciate that, I appreciate that. But I am in my 50s, so, you know, I'm on that side. But I just look good though, thank you. But anyway, okay, keeping it real, but okay, focus, focus. Okay, no, but I, a woman in my 50s, I, 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 and this is where I'm going to out myself, I'm just, why has it, it take, why has it taken me so long? And I'm, I'm, I consider myself educated, middle class. I am fortunate to be third generation homeowner um, and, the, and, and both of the books um, really provided a narrative in terms of how my grandparents back in 1918 that migrated, you know, that part of that great migration, you know, from the South, you know, they were sharecroppers in Louisiana and Mississippi, um, migrated to Chicago, cause that's home for me, um, and bought their first income property, you know, bought that first three story or, flat, so to speak, a three-story building, which they lived in one flat, and then the other two was considered income. And because of them, then my parents were homeowners. And because of that, I'm homeowner. And TJ, you need to understand that there's an expectation that you're going to own something. Okay. Anyway, so, okay. But, um, so I, but I, I have to say, the book, The Color of Law, and then this book, um, that I have the, the pleasure of introducing uh, just a prolific um, professor and author and scholar, in some ways a little ahead of her time. You must like that because I see you smiling. So. <laughs> um, just really put a narrative to all of this, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to set this up and even maybe challenge you all because I've been challenged as I've prepped for introducing um, our key our lunchtime keynote speaker. I've really been challenged at today's sessions and in this one and I think the ones in the afternoon they're they're challenging us to a call of action. We sh we sh we should not we cannot sit here and hear all of this scholarship and not feel compelled 
to do something about it. We're sitting on, we're, we're, we're in a privileged situation right now in all of our respected areas, whether, whether, whatever your vocation is, um, whatever your background is, your communities. Um, we, uh, we, we, we should be challenged to go back to these respective communities and take all of this knowledge that's been imparted um, in us today and do something with that. And I, so that, that's my challenge to you. Thank you. So let me get to the job at hand. Mm -hmm. I have the honor and privilege of introducing um, Professor Mirsa Baradaran. She is a professor of law at the University of California, Irvine, writes about banking law, financial inclusion, inequality, and the racial wealth gap. The Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap was named one of the best books of the year by the Urban Affairs Association. If you have not gotten that book, I encourage you, I challenge you to get that book. I did a little cheating and I listened to the audio book, but when I really, really, thank you, no judgment, I appreciate that. Um, but when I really resonated with a book, I will actually then pick up the hard copy because then I want to go in and highlight it and write it and, and really own it and make and, and just really engage with the book. And I definitely plan on doing that with this book as well as The Color of Law. Her work has been featured in New York Times, The Atlantic, Slate, American Banker, The Wall Street Journal, and Financial Times. She also has been on National Public Radio, Marketplace, C-SPAN, Washington Journal, and the Public Broadcasting Service, Services News Hour. I love your style. I love your presentation. She is authentic. She's genuine. So you actually get to see her personality. She, I think you're feisty. <laughs> I like, I think that's what I'm seeing. I like that. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our, our key, uh, lunchtime keynote, keynote um, Professor Misher Baradaran. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for having me. And um, let me just, uh, sorry, I mean, uh, maybe the, the feistiness, I, uh, I'm, I'm an Iranian and I'm watching the women of my country right now uh, show their feistiness in the face of um, tyranny. And so I feel like perhaps it's a, it's a shared trait that we all um, get, get at home. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the way that I come to this project, I, I am a banking law scholar and I have been writing articles and researching in banking. My first book was in banking and everything that I've done. And I kept sort of um, running up against this issue of, uh, you know, we were, kept talking about minority banking and all of this stuff. And I, and I couldn't find any uh, books, resources, articles at the time. And seeing that a lot of the banking structure was public and publicly funded, I started thinking, okay, someone surely has written, you know, this book and, and, and figured out how uh, black banking and black finance and, and, the, and the racial wealth gap affect or is affected by the mainstream banking system. And so I just looked and looked and looked and I couldn't find this book. And it, it finally dawned on me that, you know, uh, banking law scholars have been, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, you know, white conservative men for the past, you know, several hundred years, and perhaps none of them had been interested. There was one black economist uh, in Chicago in the 1930s who wrote one, you know, book about, but he, he was doing a lot of other things as well. And so I used that, those sources. So I had to really go back into uh, the banker's files, into the balance sheets, into the, the historical documents to, to tell this story. And I, I do feel like it's not ahead of the time. I feel like this story should have been told a long time ago because I think unless we have the right history, we cannot come out with the right solutions. Um, and, and you'll see how, uh, you know, as I uh, sort of go through this, um, how so many wrong solutions and some wrong unintentionally and some wrong cynically have been thrown at uh, a historic problem. 
Um, so I want to talk about the racial wealth gap, and I'm, I'm going to share um, some slides here, if you don't mind. Um, okay, let's make this um, um, bigger. Um, can you can you see me if I? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Let me, I don't know if I can change this. Okay. So this is the. Um, it, you know, you have to excuse the things. I don't know how to do it without my face there. Um, so the the racial wealth gap is um, large, and the thing that is important about this racial wealth gap is that it is larger. The gap is larger. Um, the higher in income you go, so college educated, uh, you know, wealthy, let's say, you know, doctor, black doctor, black white doctor family, that wealth gap is massive at that end versus the the lower end. So we're not. Uh, talk. This is not something that education and uh, income can remedy. And, and the reason uh, that the wealth gap uh, affects so much, one, it is uh, because it's embedded in housing. And housing is where the sort of legacy of racism and the presence of racism is embedded in market values. Uh, you see it in appraisal uh, values. I mean, you probably, I won't go into it because you had Richard Rothstein talk earlier today about how those systems really integrate it. And I'm going to talk about the the, the rest of it, the credit, the money, the, the banking system. But just to put this in perspective, um, at the dawn of emancipation, 1865, the Black community owned about 1% of total U.S. wealth. And today, that's around 1 to 1.5%. So that is a, uh, uh, you know, to say that our public policy efforts to eradicate the wealth gap um, have been a total failure would be an understatement. In fact, uh, the survey, the, the data shows that it is growing um, and has grown. There were times where it slipped as, as wealth slipped, um, but this is not something that um, uh, reduces itself over time. It has a self-perpetuating structure because of the way the economy works. And I'll, I'll try to explain some of that, but I'll also be open for question and answers. Um, so I, I think the, it is the myths that we tell about markets that present the biggest obstacles to closing the racial wealth gap and toward achieving economic justice. Um, for example, the promise is that free market capitalism, that money doesn't discriminate. So based on Adam Smith or Karl Marx, both said, well, money is colorblind, right? Uh, so uh, you know, free markets are supposed to, no matter what you bring to the market, uh, uh, reward you equally. Yet, history reveals that, in fact, markets do discriminate, or alternatively, that the American economy has never borne any resemblance to a free market. Um, for most of our history, Black men and women and communities have been excluded from occupations, schools, neighborhoods, and trades, and their property was not protected by law. Now, this is, this is an important uh, feature of this racial wealth gap in that a lot of um, property claims, I, I'm, a, I'm a law professor, so I talk about you know, property law and contract law. And the importance of property law and contract law is really ignored because usually you just have your deeds protected by the court. So you have your contracts enforced by the courts. And if it's not, you take the other person to, to court and they pay you damages. Black men and women had not been able to do that post-slavery. Not just that. There are uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, let's go, you know, terrorist, white terrorism, uh, you know, Klan or lynchings would be around those property claims. So black patent holders, a black man would, you know, or woman, usually men at the time, uh, would try to uh, file for a patent and would be met with violence or or not given that property right, right? So, so, so that theft of, of that intellectual property and the same with the property itself, the, the land. Uh, and, and this uh, obviously is, is, is a, a one of these ways that the brutality of violence mixes in economic um, inequality. And, and then there are the, the, the total uh, sort of riots that, you know, you've got Tulsa, but there are other Tulsa's. There were Wilmington, Delaware. There are, you know, Fulton, Georgia. There's several others. I, when I was writing the book, the Tulsa documents hadn't been released yet. So I was going off of, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois did some really good records and I kind of put those in, but there are others that, uh, you know, uh, where the records aren't quite available, but where a community did very well. And, um, built beautiful structures and and uh, uh, the resentment built and some act of, you know, just random thing would 
blow up and the, the black community was, were driven out of Tulsa. They were refugees in their own country. They, they escaped, you know, away with, you know, they had tags, no belongings, their homes were destroyed. Um, that, that, that's an effect of not just a, a capital, the, the destruction of capital, but it is also about uh, the, the fear of participating in, in uh, commerce again. Right? Uh, this happened to Black homeowners in the North, and I'll explain, I'll, I'll tell one story in just a second if I have some time. So, uh, you know, there, in each historical moment where wealth was being created in, in this country, uh, whether it was through the Homestead Act, the FHA, you talked about the mortgage credit today, uh, Black communities were shut out of this, uh, 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 the, the subsidies. And then at pivotal, certain pivotal moments, and I'm, I'm going to try to talk about two, reconstruction and civil rights, and they have a very parallel structure. Um, Black communities, when they were demanding uh, intervention, uh, if you think about oh, what enslavement meant, enslavement was, you know, you went from being capital, you were capital and labor, which is, which is a very um, profitable uh, uh, enterprise, enslavement was. Um, but they went from being capital to participating in capitalism, right? And uh, you know, Frederick Douglass says, we have no wealth, no friends, no property, no money. How, how are we supposed to do it? So the idea was you would get the, uh, you know, the, the, the fair do not, you know, not quite fair, but uh, at, at a recompense, at least you divide up the, the plantations and give, you know, 40 acres. And those, those efforts were cut off. And instead, there was some sort of rhetoric of the free market that was used um, to block that. So I'll give one example. Um, so in other words, uh, you know, instead of real reform, the Black community has been offered self-help and the rhetoric of sort of uh, personal responsibility and uh, free markets. And um, leaders uh, upholding these dominant white structures promised that the markets would fix things that law and policy had created in the first place. Um, so let's start with Reconstruction. Um, during Reconstruction, uh, the freedmen, of course, were expected to make this transition from being currency. Now, free, the currency of the South was um, enslavement, and it wasn't just the bodies that were held on the plantations. It was um, capital, collateral. So if you think about if you have a home now or if you have an asset, uh, if you're you know, a bank, you have tons of assets and you can... Um, get collateral on those assets. So you have, you know, you have mortgage-backed securities, you have co collateralized debt obligations. Those were built on slave ownership. Okay, so you had your property in, in humans, and you could collateralize other property on top of that. And so that entire Southern banking system was very much uh, reducing currency um, on that uh, system of slavery. And so when the North, you know, the, that's why Lincoln had to uh, issue the greenback, which is the first U.S. dollar is the greenback, right, um, to uh, cut off the northern economy from the southern economy. So it was very much, it was a war about enslavement, but it was also a war about what kind of economic structure uh, would we have. So um, so after this, this the war, uh, the, the, you know, uh, Black men and uh, women and their abolitionist allies you know, uh, said, you know, without land, freedom would be meaningless. And um, of course, President Andrew Johnson uh, vetoed the land grant. Uh, even after some uh, Black communities had had gotten it, um, he vetoed it. And he reasoned um, in his veto bill that freedmen would be protected by the free market and contract law, that they would bargain for fair wages, and they would buy their own land and, uh, you know, be able to participate in commerce. So this was either you know, unbelievably naive or incredibly cynical, probably the latter. Um, the Southern economy was nothing like a free market. Whites refused to sell property uh, to Blacks. Southern legislators, lawyers, and judges drafted laws um, governing uh, every aspect of Black labor, right? So there's freedom codes or Black codes where if you were caught loitering, uh, if you were out walking instead of, uh, you know, working, uh, growing cotton, you would be sent to, without due process, to a prison. And if you haven't read um, Douglas Blackman's Slavery by Another Name, you really should, because there's this whole other enterprise of exploiting Black labor in the convict leasing system, where they would, if you were a convict and sent to prison, you would go to the steel mines and work basically uh, for, for the rest of your life. Um, and, and the wages were capped by sort of a cabal between employers, right? They would say, well, we will do um, no more than this. And uh, sharecropping became a very prominent um, debt system, right? So, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois calls it just basically re-enslavement through debt. And here's, here's what's important to understand, uh, is that it's not just 
racial animus that did this. It's not like, oh, they hated them and so they had to do it. It was the cotton market, okay? Um, and it, if we understand this, we can understand uh, how things work in the economy. So the cotton prices were low and uh, because enslavement is a very efficient system of cotton production. And um, the, uh, you know, there were Liverpool merchants, uh, the sort of early dawn of capitalism was based on the cotton trade. So there'd be shipping, uh, you know, in Liverpool and in, in England, they were uh, sort of uh, a big cotton trade overseas. And then in the North, you were investing in cotton trade. You were um, doing whatever markets do as a commodity. And it was the most profitable commodity coming out of the United States. It was, a, it was like our biggest export. And as you know, this civil war is happening. A lot of our trade partners were kind of kind of waiting to see what happened. Um, in order to have, have cotton exports, um, you know, they they you needed to have the production of cheap and abundant cotton. Okay. And that was only possible if the freedmen grew it. Um, because the alternative history here is uh, the Haitian Revolution. The Haitian Revolution had happened just before the Civil War. And in Haiti, the freed uh freedmen took took their land and um, they decided to, when you are, when you own your own land, you're going to be reasonable about what you grow. You're going to grow a debt crop and a cash crop. Uh, a lot of, a lot of people didn't want to grow the slavery crop, right? They just didn't want to grow sugar anymore in Haiti, but they grew, you know, food for their families and some other like diversifying their uh, trades. And this is what was expected that the freedmen would do. In fact, the few free uh, communities that did get land were uh, diversifying and uh, using, you know, uh, growing all sorts of uh, really profitable um, fruits, right? Like watermelons. This is this became a trope later on, but watermelon was like a very uh, profitable um, uh, uh, crop that these um, communities in Edisto County uh, figured out how to grow and really ship ship to market. So uh, there was every reason to believe that cotton prices would, uh, uh, you know, rise because there would be less supply, right? The less supply, the higher the prices. Um, so, you know, in the meantime, so that, so, so you have this, a uh, free market thing that is, uh, you know, kind of a, a ruse, right? It's, it's, it's bullshit. There's no such thing, right? They were, um, enforcing this through law. Um, so they, uh, you know, and, and he said, you know, uh, Andrew Johnson is like, America shall, will, will be and shall remain a white man's government. Uh, and this white man's government, you know, had control over capital and land. Um, because it had control over lawmaking and through that sort of state's monopoly on violence. But instead of getting land, um, the freed, uh, sorry, this cot um, cotton, uh, the freed, Freedman got a bank, a savings bank in 1865 um, called the Freedman Savings Bank. And it was the only, it was the first bank chartered by Congress for any reason. Um, and, you know, the, 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 these were the union generals. Uh, so General o Oliver Otis Howard explained that the bank was better than land because you could use, you know, thrift and savings. Freedmen should, and this is direct quote, freedmen should earn land and not receive it as a gift. Um, I just, uh, you know, the, 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 the fact of hundreds of years of enslavement and the fact that they actually fought in the war. <laughs> You know, they earned that land many, many times over, but yet it went back to, a lot of times, the land went back to the Southern oligarchs, the, the plantation owners who had treasonously, you know, fought against the, the United States or the, the Union. You know, you had, you know, Robert E. Lee, many of these uh, Confederate traders, right, died in their beds um, at night, like at, when they were old, I'm saying, right? They, it was they they were they had no no uh, repercussions. So, uh, the Freedmen's Bank was the only tangible creation that survived the Freedmen's uh, veto, and no bank before or ever since has resembled the Freedmen's Bank. It was created, it was signed by Lincoln, and um, the bank was immediately successful. It was embraced by the freed slaves, um, and one of the main reasons they trusted the bank is this money. And this is this is uh, important to understand about money, right? So at the time, money. Uh, there wasn't a lot of money being issued by the U.S. It was greenbacks that was starting, but a lot of what was uh, being traded were bank notes. So you look at, you know, you have a treasury note now. You have, you know, you can go and get, you know, a check from your bank. That's a note. Uh, the system back then, this is before deposit insurance, before a, a really sophisticated banking system. A note for a bank, uh, you could go to that bank to redeem it, and the bank could be. Uh, bankrupt. Okay. Um, and so these notes 
uh, were very valuable because they looked to be supported by the federal government because they had Lincoln's face on them, the, 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 the inscriptions of, you know, this Grant, Sherman, um, and, and the generals, and because of this uh, assumed government backing, uh, people trusted the bank and they put all of their savings in there. So, uh, and, and the mission of the bank was also, it was to uh, reserve the funds as a savings bank. So they weren't lending, which is the way to grow wealth through loans. They weren't doing that, but they were, it was sort of like a glorified piggy bank. And they spread the sort of propaganda across the South to kind of save this money. And the, and the data that, that's now being done on this through surveys and through uh, really meticulous records is that a lot of people who were you know, men and women uh, were depositing where women weren't getting accounts in other places. And um, if, you know, some Irish workers who were debt, debt, uh, you know, like, um, uh, what, what do you call it, in debt, indebted, uh, whatever workers uh, would also use these banks because there was other, you know, discriminatory um, institutions. And so you had a couple other uh, uh, groups of people, but mostly uh, freedmen. So the capital grew in this bank to about $1.5 billion. Um, let's see if I have this uh, building here. Um, uh, is about $1.5 billion, and it was um, a, a lot of money in today's money. There's $1.5 billion in today's money. And the white manager, the white president of the bank, Henry Cook, uh, he, his brother uh, was the infamous Jay Cook of the sort of railroad speculation bond market. And that $1.5 billion in today's money was a lot of capital to just leave there, which is what they were supposed to do. So they didn't. They used that money to speculate on railroad bonds. and in that time of, you know, the, the, this is the gilded age of lots of stock market, market turmoil, they lost the money, okay? It was gone. And uh, uh, Frederick Douglass was brought in as bank president uh, to sort of save the bank after they had lost the money. And Frederick Douglass comes in and he gives the bank his own money. He lends, he keeps lending them money and realizes, you know, he says it's, it was full of dead men's bones. Like I didn't know, you know, he's very, um, uh, evocative language, but he went to Congress and said, you need to pull this charter because people are investing and, and there's no money in the bank. And so the significance of this failure reverberated through like a century, uh, the century of post after this. This is 1888 when the bank, or 18, uh, in, the, in, in the 1890s when it was finally, uh, uh, the charter was withdrawn. And I was doing interviews of people today, like, you know, when I was doing the, the, the research for the book who said, you know, my grand mother or whatever, my mother lost their savings and told me not to um, uh, put my money in a bank, right? Uh, which was the right lesson to get actually from this failure. And uh, you know, if you look at the data, I began this project actually just with this one question because I my first couple articles and books were about this inequality in banking and un unbanked and underbanked people. There's just groups of people who don't have a bank account, which means that they don't have access to the free sort of subsidized check cashing system that the Fed runs sort of through the federal government, and uh, looked at this, you know, the rates for uh, Black populations was phenomenally higher, just much higher, especially in the South, where the unbanked and underbanked rate was 60%, and the sort of uh, a white was about 13%. And uh, not, not to do with income. The number one reason was trust, distrust. And a lot of this is because you, t you, pass these legacies down, you don't get the land, right? You, you promise the land, you don't get that. You promise the bank, they take your money, um, right? And so that that is the, the, the legacy of that bank. And, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois says of this failure, he says not even 10 additional years of slavery. I mean, imagine 10 years of slavery, um, I added, could have done so much to throttle the thrift of the freedmen as the mismanagement and bankruptcy of the freedmen's bank chartered by the nation for their aid. Right, so um, no one, no one was prosecuted. Henry Cook, Henry Cook also did not um, get any get any punishment. And um, so, uh, by the time the Freedmen's Bank failed, the um, disenfranchisement of the black population was almost complete. So, after Reconstruction failed, there was a, a period of time where there was a genuine uh, effort at democracy. And W. E. B. Du Bois is, is the the, pers the 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 historian here on Black Reconstruction. It's he does a thousand pages, and I don't know if it's available on audio, but you you know it's it's a it's a, a phenomenal account of this era, and he he talks about it. Look, this was the one time that America tried democracy. We tried to have representation, 
And so it was violently overthrown by uh, the, the Democratic Party in the South that used white supremacy to divide uh, the white lower classes, the sharecroppers, and the black sharecroppers, uh, because that was a really powerful coalition of people against the sharecropping system. So they, they did that. So, and then the Supreme Court uh, took the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments and reinterpreted them to mean that they were protective of corporations, if you can believe it. So, uh, I don't know if you listened to the Supreme Court hearings, Kentaji Brown Jackson's first Black Supreme Court justice who was just, um, had her first hearing this uh, week or last week. And uh, the argument was about the 14th Amendment. And uh, it is clearly, if anyone knows any history, like a little bit of history, you know that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment were passed right after the Civil War to free the slaves. 13th was emancipation or no, no enslavement. There's loopholes, obviously, for criminals, which th they used for convict leasing. 14th was no, you know, uh, equal protection under the law, uh, due process. And the 15th was voting. And uh, over, you know, through legal loopholes, the South revised that to uh, other things. And then the Supreme Court steps in in the 14th Amendment and the railroads come to the Supreme Court and say, um, we don't want to pay taxes in these states. So taxes, they are taxing us more than other people. And so that is discrimination. That's not due process. That's not equal protection under the law. And so the court says yes, and use the 14th Amendment more to protect corporations against uh, state taxation than Black men and women. Um, to the extent that uh, Kentaji Brown Jackson has to make an argument that is not going to convince the court that actually the 14th Amendment was for the protection of Black men and women. Uh, such such is the the like real reinterpretation of this amendment. And, and 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 you know obviously the civil rights movement would not have been necessary if these amendments had been uh, uh, kept. So you know just to say that uh, progress progress you have we have to hold on to progress um, uh, when 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 it happens. So. Um, so then, you know, I'm going to skip over actually the New Deal. Um, uh, before I, I, there's a couple of good stories because this is a tragedy. <laughs> um, but the, the few good stories are um, uh, Maggie uh, Walker um, was a um, uh, a banker in uh, that she was the first uh, female uh, banker of any race, and she um, had. Uh, her bank was in Richmond, and she sort of was part of the St. Luke's Penny's Bank and did a lot of, um, you know, everything. She had a newspaper, she had a student loan account, she, uh, or, or student loan uh, monies. She would, you know, do little uh, piggy banks for the kids and uh, had uh, one of the most successful banks of the era, actually. So in 1888, she was one of the first uh, Black banks and one of the first, she's the first female bank president. And uh she ran her bank so well that, you know, she was the first Black person inducted into the Virginia Bankers Association, which in the state of Virginia is just quite a feat. And uh, she was one of only five banks, Black banks, that survived the Great Depression. As, as you know, the Great Depression wiped out many banks. And her bank actually uh, uh, gave the liquidity to all the other Black-owned banks because she had so on her bank and she was you know uh inducted as a uh, the president of the black bankers association and was just a brilliant uh banker a businesswoman and was um uh you know and she says she's like i'm doing this for my community especially the women you know she had she had been in an, in an abusive relationship and she needed that money to get out and so she she felt like her mission was to give women uh, and she obviously gave loans to men, but she really focused on giving women that financial freedom. She gave you know, like 800 mortgage loans and, and, and in a time where there, those weren't that available and there were so few funds, um, so few mortgages at all to, to Black men and women. Um, okay, so then you have the sort of great migration um, northward and um, this, this is, you know, a, a massive sort of uh, dislocation pushed out of the South by violence, you know, bull weevil, the recession, and pushed into the North by the Industrial Revolution and jobs and sort of um, growing cities. But as uh, a Black men and women get to the North and the West, there are, there is, of course, the segregation line. So housing segregation, actually, the, the sophisticated system of housing segregation begins in the North, 
not in the South. The South had Jim Crow, North invented segregation. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how much Richard Rothstein uh, has covered, but I've spoken with him. So I imagine he covered the whole New Deal sector. This is one chapter in my book and our books came out actually the same month. So I didn't, you know, accidentally named mine the same as his anyway. Um, so what the New Deal does is completely restructures. Um, so this is, you know, what, what was met uh, and worse, right? Uh, for many black bankers. L let me just tell one story before I get to the New Deal. Um, Jesse Binga is one of the stories in my book. He's a black banker in um, Chicago who I feel like should have a documentary at least or a movie about his life um, as uh, just uh, a fascinating, he gets to Chicago, he's a real estate broker at first, he's just a hustle, um, you know, selling real estate, he, he starts a bank, and then starts another bank, so he's, the, he, and he's got the, the, the most profitable commercial banks in the North, and he um, uh, buys th this house, you know, in this, in the nice neighborhood in Chicago, and his house keeps getting bombed by, you know, the white neighbors, uh, because, uh, the economics of it was that if you had a few black families, the few black families that first moved into a neighborhood paid a premium, uh, something like 30 or 45 percent higher than the average price. But then if the neighborhood flipped, so maybe, uh, you know, five, five percent of this economist at the time uh, calculated of black families, uh, then the, there would be white flight. So anyone white would would leave that neighborhood because they felt it was turning over. Um, so then the properties would plummet. So if you're thinking about it from a financial perspective, from a bank that owns that loan, uh, you've given a loan on that value, and now it's it's basically underwater the second you've given that loan. So you have to be very uh, much better at banking. And and Jesse Bingo was a good banker, but he was still always frustrated by this dynamic. The other thing was you're constantly giving loans to black buyers, but that money isn't coming back. The white owners of the of the property get those assets and those assets keep leaving those communities. That's the sort of um, the, the dilemma that, that Bingo was in. The other is this. So his house was bombed 10 times and he kept you know, going to the newspaper and saying, I'm an American citizen. I can live where I want. It's just really kind of, you know, uh, would not be um, threatened out of it. But what got Binga in the end is during the Great Depression, uh, as banks were failing, he had, uh, you know, joined a, a thing called a clearinghouse, which is what banks do. This is before the Federal Reserve, before the FDIC, where like well-run banks will join a consortium together to protect each other if there's a run. A run is just, we're, we're really dangerous and we'll take down banks. And so they would lend to each other. And he was the only black banker allowed into the Chicago clearinghouse. Um, but in those records that put this, they basically discriminated. They, you know, they called them, you know, the N word, and said we're not going to give the funds to them. They would just they kept the funds, and this is funds that he was paying into for years. This is an insurance fund. He he was he was owed those funds in in the shortfall and did not get those funds, and the other banks did. So uh, clear display of like the complexity of actually trying to run a business, you know, and um, in, amidst just a, a hostile climate. Um, but worse than that, uh, you know, nobody, no bankers ever go to jail, right? Uh, well, uh, Jesse Binga was prosecuted for the failure of his bank in uh, 1929. He's the only banker um, that that actually served time. And Clarence Darrow, uh, a famous lawyer, came to his defense and got him out of prison, but after like six years or seven years that he'd already served, uh, and, and he was innocent. Um, uh, I will... So, so you know, after the New Deal, of course, and I'm happy to, I, I don't know what the timing is. I, I can um, take questions, but I'm going to go through just really quick to the, um, uh, past the New Deal and then through the civil rights era. Um, if you just give me one second. Okay. So New Deal, you saw the, the, the red line maps. Um, I will just say, I want add one thing to what probably Rothstein explained is that not just it was not just mortgage credit there was also a consumer credit fha uh, loan structure and in the suburbs in the white suburbs as americans were growing wealth and equity and you're getting all the roads and schools and parks and all of that tax base that goes into those um public facilities and in the the uh, red line area you're not getting any of those you're also getting the highways sort of cut through your neighborhood 
There's also this consumer credit structure that starts to happen in the suburbs. You have credit cards that are a revolving interest rate. That's with the FHA, they're subsidized. Their interest rate, they're capped at 6%. Same with the banks. They were That was part of the New Deal is interest rate caps, like a, a proliferation of banks. Um, and it's all in the book. You can read kind of the data there. But um, and in the in the red line areas, uh, there wasn't there wasn't that there wasn't the mortgage loans and there wasn't the consumer loans. And what there was was installment debt. And installment debt is like if you go to like a rent a center or like a payday lender, um, it is very expensive debt. And it was all that was available. So you would get your, let's say, refrigerator from an installment lender, and they would bundle bundle the contract in such a way that you could pay essentially the whole thing off and like twice the principal and still have defaults. And they would come with repo men and all of that. And, and the, the business model of these lenders was basically they were reusing and reselling these products, right? So it was very um, uh, coercive. It was very profitable. Um, for the lenders, but it was um, incredibly uh, onerous. And the early sort of seeds of the civil rights movement and the tactics used started actually in the North fighting this installment debt. So on the one hand, you had, you know, like a, a groups called like the Mothers of Harlem um, or, or groups of Chicago sort of contract uh, borrowers who would go to the legislature and press on laws for um, usuries and interest rate caps to be enforced against these lenders. So the Harlem mothers were actually successful in the legislature and got the New York state to uh, tamp down on these lenders. Now, there was no black owned bank in Harlem in New York for the entire golden era of black banking. There was 200 black owned banks in the country, none in Harlem, none in New York. And this was surprising to me. I uh, so I looked into that, and what um, what it turned out was that Chase Manhattan had uh, sort of a monopoly in Harlem, and they loved to take the deposits and lend them downtown. Um, so they would kind of you know the, get the liquidity and do the business loans, and with the with the guise of you know I found some, a dissertation from a Chase Bank teller who wrote in the 1930s about this business model, saying look that they're they're bad business risks in Harlem. But they're good business risks down there. You know, it's like self-fulfilling prophecy. If you're not giving business loans, how are people supposed to start businesses, right? So um, that, uh, uh, and then Chase, the president of Chase, was on the board of New York State Chartering. Now you can't prove that that's what happened, but um, there's many press articles about it, and uh, basically that seems to be the explanation because there's no other place where there were no black banks. Um, and Harlem had one of the biggest populations. So uh, that's that's one thing that that was the the sort of uh, negative of that downside. The positive was it was that because there were no uh, black owned banks, it was just those lenders, and so they got to go to the legislature and say, "Look, these are the only lenders in our communities, and you must enforce it." And so they did, and it worked a little bit. The other thing that they started doing was to do um, boycotts and um, a sort of community action around. Um, uh, defaults and uh, repossession. So for example, someone would, you know, the, the repo men would come to the house and take all the stuff out or they, they would evict. And the group, the whole community would show up and put the furniture back. And then they would take it out and then they would put, put the furniture back. You know, and you, you see several memoirs of people in this era, like Muhammad Ali talks about, that was his consciousness was just showing up and putting furniture back in people's homes. It was something that was just a really collective, and then they would just give up, right? Um, and on the, the boycotts, there was actually, there were several groups that would go to these lenders and, and boycott, just stand in the front and say, nobody go inside, right? It's real kind of, you have to get everyone's involvement. And one of these lenders in the 1939, I think it's in the, it's in the book, I don't know the exact date, took the boycotters to, to court and said, this is illegal. It's against my constitutional right to do business. You can't boycott me. That's like my right, you know? And the court said, no, this is this is actually, you know, it's a protest and it's political speech um, and gave the protesters that right to do it. And so that kind of starts the model, which gets, you know, obviously there's, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois and a couple other uh, black press were kind of communicating with each other. And said, look, look, look at this victory. And so that gets uh, down to the South. And they say, you know, this is uh, Martin Luther King takes the uh, sort of charged to um, the, the public in 1950s in this Ebony article. And he says, you know, we'd like five goals. 
um, and it was boycotts, you know, uh, as the North was doing, uh, cr creating our own banks, creating our own credit unions, um, creating our own unions. And it was like number six was like voting and civil rights, you know, it was really kind of based on stopping this exploitative credit and debt structure. Uh, his first speech, uh, Martin Luther King's last speech before he's uh, assassinated, murdered, is um, uh, a, a bank in movement in Memphis. He's there and he says, we need to put our money into the black banks in, in Memphis. Uh, the tri-state bank was that bank. Um, so, you know, really, uh, I think we miss the focus of the, of, of the civil rights movement if we're just focusing on that part of it. And the same with, you know, Malcolm X, and uh, the black separatists who basically uh, said, look, you know, uh, Malcolm X starts by saying, why should white, white people run the, 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 all the stores in our, in our neighborhood, right? We should have um, some semblance of, of uh, um, uh, presence. So this is when things get uh, weird and cynical. Again, so I want us to remember Johnson and I want us to remember what happened with the Freedmen's Bank. And what Nixon does is add the civil rights um, so between 1965 and 1969, a lot changes. The country's, um, there's a backlash. Um, I don't know if you've started seeing that backlash to Black Lives Matter. You're all of a sudden starting to see, oh, critical race theory, all of this. You know, some people who are, you know, can, can be kind of angry. Uh, and Nixon really was brilliant at exploiting this. I mean, I should, I, I guess I could talk about President Trump. Uh, don't want to get political, but uh, I mean, you can't explain it any other way. Um, so uh, Nixon, um, the um, rhetoric of the Black Power movement, and said, yes, we want Black power, Black pride, Black jobs, and that is through uh, Black capitalism. So that was his program. And Black capitalism was like the Freedmen's Bank, okay? It was not capital. And Hubert Humphrey, his, his opponent, says, you can't have black capitalism without capital. But that's exactly what he wanted to do. So Nixon creates affirmative action. That's a Nixon creation. He says, volunteers, you know, from corporations, please just hire. And, you know, GM and a couple others do it. And that only leads to more backlash, which actually Nixon loves. He's, the, 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 the Nixon tapes are just, I mean, it's it's really quite, he, he was pretty methodical about that, right? Uh, it's, 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 all, it's all there. Um, and uh, he basically, um, says, you know, he, he supports black owned banks. He um, says, well, we're going to do black business. And the idea here is that he can't do integration. So the alternative history here as another Republican, George Romney, Mitt Romney's dad, was his content, his, his opponent and didn't get it, but becomes Nixon's HUD uh, uh, director. And George Romney is like a zealot about housing. He's like this, you know, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, this is like a, the white neighborhoods a noose around the black ghetto, right? He talks about it in those terms. And in Michigan, he tried several times to integrate and really face like community backlash, but less so than that. I think Nixon understands that it's a political risk. And so he kicks, uh, so, so Romney keeps pushing these integration plans. It's all these memos he's writing to Nixon. Like, if you just understand, it's like explaining to him how the economics works. And finally, you know, Nixon says, just send him to Mexico. So he sends him uh, as an ambassador to Mexico. Romney tries even to go around him and go right to Congress and it really pisses Nixon off. So he sends him away. And so that's the last time that the Supreme Court or that, that, that the federal government actually tried like an actual integration program. After that, the courts uh, make that impossible because they say essentially, uh, you don't, you can't discriminate. You can't say no black people here, but you can zone uh, against multifamily dwellings, and you can zone in any way, basically schools, taxes, and that's basically how how it's done now. And a uh, part of that is because the, of the racial wealth gap. It makes wealth basically synonymous with. Uh, race for a lot of people, not always. There are obviously exceptions of wealthy black uh, neighborhoods and poor white neighborhoods, obviously. But for the most part, and if we're talking means, that's how it is. And you can track those red lines, actually, and you know you these racial dot maps and, uh, maps, and those have stayed. Without that intervention, uh, that's when it was cut off in 1968. And ever since then, and this is, you know, I think important to know is that Nothing else has been done. We we have this image of civil rights as, as like a finally equality. And yes, voting 
and uh, proper, you know, due process, those were rights in the 13th, the 14th, and 15th Amendment, right? Uh, those basically, it was just saying deregulating the South, Jim Crow, like stop doing Jim Crow. That that was, you know, I, I don't mean to diminish the achievement because it was, it took a lot of effort and and, and lives, um, but it it really wasn't like you know a, a complete. Uh, it wasn't complete justice. It wasn't complete repair. It wasn't complete uh, damages, just in the way that the the forty acres should have been given. Um, so you know, I'm sorry. Yes. We would love to be able to take. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. No, no. no please this don't is apologize. It. This is it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are like this, full blown that, scholar mode, it. right? Okay. Yeah. Amazing. Sorry. What, Amazing. Just, okay. So, and, and lest I leave out, if I have any bipartisans, it was Clinton too. That's the only thing I wanted to add. Is it, it lasted through uh, the other. Gotta love her. <laughs> I bet your students love you. <laughs> Sometimes. I'm, I'm tough. <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't, yeah. Okay. So, okay. Can you say what you're going to say about Clinton? And then we're going to take a few questions, okay? That's it. Yeah. Just, just that Clinton, you know, uh, really doubled down on this Black capitalism bit in a different way called the community enterprise and community capitalism or... You know, Larry Summers is his uh, treasury uh, director. And, and really the idea was like, we're going to send entrepreneurs and they're going to make money. And that's how we're going to cure the racial wealth gap. Well, the entrepreneurs found money and it was subprime loans. And that, that you know, really um, uh, was a blow to the black community. If, if you want, I mean, all of this is in the book. So yep. just, it, it's all there. <laughs> Great segue. Yes, please. Let's give her a round of applause. Great Thank segue. You. Wow. She just gave us a drop of the book, okay? <laughs> so during the next break, please, please, please go purchase the book. I think we can take maybe two questions. Yeah. Okay. We're already eating into our break. So I do see a hand right here and a hand over there, and that's gonna be our two questions. So this gentleman right here, right there. Come on, Mike. Now my name is Mike, all right. My own mom changed my name. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. There have been a number of you know, modern examples of where the banking system continues to perpetuate the same atrocities against black people and black community. What options are there for us today to either divest from those systems and institutions and to create something new that provides the benefits without the harm or some other way of kind of getting ourselves sort of freed from these, you know, atrocious systems that do us no good. Yeah. Okay. Two things. Um, one is boycotts do work. Uh, attention works. Black Lives Matter. I mean, I uh, put my book out in a world that didn't care. And I was trying to convince people, you guys. And then after Black Lives Matter, I had, you know, JP Morgan, Chase, all of these banks being like, what can we do? You know, and, and you know, so they, they care. They care for marketing purposes, but if you keep that pressure on and watch, watch not just what they're doing with the loans and this BS about, oh, they're, they're, they like release these programs that end up, they're like, oh, we're doing a hundred million dollars or something in lending. Uh, and then you look at the numbers and it's actually nothing that they're not already doing. So they can spin that, but, but they do, they, they, they have um, a, a marketing angle that can be used in that way politically. The other thing is to watch their lobbyists. It's not just the marketing. It's what banks do in Washington, because I really actually think Washington is more of a problem than corporations, I will say, because I think corporations at least are looking at the market. You look at you know, Nike, a lot of them did the cost benefit analysis during BLM and decided to go with BLM rather than the other side, because those, a lot of, you know, like high net worth people were more on that side. How much they were on that side, who knows? But um, Washington uh, lives on backlash and you have a whole party that turns it for profit and um, lobbying. And here you see that a lot on the banking committee. Uh, you, we couldn't get any, the, the, look, I was a nominee for one of the Biden regulators. Look at how many, Bank regulators Biden was able to nominate zero, 
we had, we got no nominees um, because they picked off Manchin and the Senate Banking Committee halted. So we couldn't get reforms. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's a, that's a major problem with democracy that many people yes. aren't, yeah. Absolutely. Aware We're of. gonna mm -hmm. take one more question, gentlemen. I'm um, sorry. I'm um, sorry, thank miss. You. Yes, thank you for taking my question, but mm -hmm. I have one comment first. One of my favorite com um, comments is from Frederick Douglass when he was president of the Freedmen's Bank. And he wrote to his friend, Andrew Greeley, who did the Gazette. And he said that the federal, that the Freedmen's Bank was the black man's um, cow, but the white man's milk. And mm -hmm. I think that's very appropriate to what she's talking about at this point. But now I am now working with younger children and we mm -hmm. are trying to talk about entrepreneurship and mm -hmm. um, finances. So my question to you, even as young as third graders who we work with, um, mm -hmm. how do we go about in getting them involved? Because a lot of our parents, you know, don't trust mm -hmm. banks historically. Uh, we understand mm -hmm. why, but how do mm -hmm. we change that image of banking mm -hmm. and saving your money to children of color? Yeah, um, I would say it starts and ends with, you know, just education, un understanding how the system works, understanding, you know, because I think what, what you're seeing right now is like skepticism being turned into conspiracy theories, you know, so there's just a lot of just, not in the black community, I'm talking about, you know, like the, the, the you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene still talks about like the Rothschilds and stuff. So I think there are these just misnomers, there's anything that's a complex system, like vaccine development or whatever, people tend to distrust and then blow it up into some other thing. The Federal Reserve is one of these things that people don't understand it. And so they, they think it's doing ridiculous things. And, and, and that, that I think is a problem for those of us who want to do reform, because if you just de, you know, delegitimize the whole institution, then it's really difficult to reform it. So just really explaining the complexities. I mean, I, I would say, um, you know, I mean, uh, education, learning about the financial crisis, maybe through the big short or one of these movies. You know, I, I, I show my class this uh, book called Breaking the Banks. I don't know how old the kids are, but there's there's a couple of good bank kind of explanations that are accessible to younger people. I think that's, that's the first. And then just saying, you know, uh, just education in general, really just go to college and, you know, make money, put it in a bank account right away. But that this is not your problem. It's not your you know, uh, the racial wealth gap is a structural issue. Now, there are things that you can do to make sure that it doesn't, the sharp edges of it don't hit you personally, but it's it's also about solidarity. And we're not going to fix this uh, just by individual good decisions, because it's not about bad decisions. It's about structures. And we can change those while making good decisions. Wow. Wow. Can we please give <laughs> Professor Baranadon Thank you. a round of applause? I mean, this was just riveting. Thank you. I'm sorry I got carried away. I got really excited about that. <laughs> but we, but we so, love yeah. it. We love your passion. You. We love your Thank enthusiasm. You. Um, and I, I think we all feel like you know you just took us to school. So we were, felt you. like we were sitting in the classroom <laughs> with you, Professor. Um, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. At thank this you. point, we're gonna.